Um, so I guess we can get started now. Okay, so hey guys, uh, welcome back to our uh, general lecture series. And today we're gonna be talking about bitwise operations. So basically the idea behind bitwise operations is um, if you're given two numbers, uh, A and B, um, usually non-negative integers, although you can do some similar tricks like this if you have like negative integers or something like that. We're not really gonna go into that. But uh, basically we wanna consider their binary representations, right? So like if you look at seven and 13, uh, we're basically looking at these two bit strings. And the idea with binary, uh, with bitwise operations is we're gonna do some operations on these two uh, bit strings and then convert back to a number basically. Um, so because of the way uh, that like numbers are stored, it doesn't actually have to do any conversion um, like on the actual machine, but it's sort of a useful way to think about it is like converting to the strings, doing something to these strings and then converting back. Uh, and, um, and these sorry. operations are all built in for most languages. And the reason it's called bit wise is because it does bit per bit for each, in, uh, for each position in the bit string. It does it separately. And that's sort of a nice property that you'll see. Yeah. Okay, so the first operation is bitwise AND, which is uh, the AND operator in most languages. So it's like half of the Boolean AND operator. Um, and basically A and B is the number where the ith bit is set if it's set in both A and B. So if we look at like seven and 13, um, these are their binary representations. And you can see that in these two positions, we have um, AI and BI both equal one. So then uh, those positions equal one for A and B. And for everything else, um, E equals zero. So in this case, we would get five as A and B. Um, the next operator is bitwise OR, uh, which is the pipe operator in most languages. So again, it's like half of the Boolean OR operator. Um, and the ith bit of A or B is set um, if at least one of the ith bit in A and the ith bit in B is set. So in this case, um, again, seven, this should be seven or 13. Um, so we, we look at all the positions and if at least one of the two is one, um, then we set the ith bit in A or B to be one. So in this case, for these four positions, um, at least one is one in all of them. So uh, these are all ones down here. Uh, but notice that uh, the, into, the way you represent these integers would have like say 32 or 64 bits. And um, everything past here would be uh, all zeros, same here. Um, and because they're all zeros, they would stay zeros here. So we can sort of ignore them. And that's sort of the same thing we can do with A and B and a lot of these operations. So we can sort of pretend that they only have however many bits, but in reality, it does it on the full 32 or 64. Okay, and then the third operator is, oh wait, bitwise XOR. Uh, so again, this should be the XOR symbol, same here. Um, but this is the caret operator in most languages. Um, and here, the ith bit of A XOR B is set um, if the bits don't match in A and B at that position. So for all of these positions before here, they're uh, all zeros in A and B. Um, so they match. So we're going to set them equal to zeros down here. Uh, same thing with these two positions that are both one uh, in both of them. So those match. So we set those to be zero. But then in this position here, where we have zero, one, in this position we have one, zero. So those don't match. So we set them to be one. So uh, we get there at like 10. Uh, and uh, sort of explanation for the name uh, XOR is it stands for exclusive OR. And it kind of gives another way to look at it is that um, exactly one of A and B have to be one. So you have A or B, but not both. That's the same thing as not matching. Any questions? So moving on. Oh yeah, so uh, first just some quick copies of XOR, because these come up a lot in Code Forces rounds. Uh, can, can you guys still see me? Uh, Keith, is it working? 
Yeah, yeah, it's working, man. Okay, cool. Yeah, so uh, some properties of XOR that come up a lot in CoForces rounds. Uh, so one is it's associative. So if you have A X or B uh, parentheses X or C, then you can move the parentheses around B and C instead. Uh, also, A X or zero is A for anything. Um, and also, A X or itself is always zero because all the bits in A and A match. Um, so now, and then we also have if uh, A X or B equals C, then these two also hold. Um, which you can show by sort of substituting in A, X, or B for C here, and then using these two rules here. And that will give you these two statements. OK. Uh, so then there is the left shift operator, which is uh, two less than most languages. And basically what it represents is uh, multiplying by 2 to the j, if you shift left by j. Um, not exactly, because there's some overflow issues, but we'll talk about that. Uh, basically, what it does is it just takes the bits and moves them left by j positions um, and pads the right with zeros. So if we shift 6 left by 2, we basically just add two zeros to the end. Um, and then, like we said before, it's the same as if we did 6 times 2 squared. So yeah, we have to be careful about overflow in this case, um, because if any bits go past the size of the integer type you're using, they get just like truncated. Uh, so you need to make sure you don't overflow. So um, yeah, in C++, um, if you do just one shifted to the J, that it's only going to work up to J equals 31, because one is an int. Um, but if you do one LL shifted to the J, then you can go up to 63. So basically, for the rest of the presentation, we're going to be using one LL shifted to the J whenever we need to do something like that. And like in most um, competitive programming problems, most things will fit in a 64-bit int. So you usually don't need to worry about overflowing in this case, but it's just something to keep in mind. So then there's also a right shift, um, which is basically doing the opposite. You're moving the bits to the right. So if you right shift by j, um, you're basically deleting the last j bits um, and moving everything else over to fill the space. So if we shift 14 by 2, um, we cut off these last two bits here. There's 1, 0, and we're left with 1, 1, which is 3. OK, and then we have bitwise not, which basically just flips all the bits in your uh, integer. Um, and again, this is one where it really matters like what the size of your integer type is, because this is really the only one that messes with your leading zeros, because um, it turns them all into leading ones. So like if you have a equals 5, uh, then a would be this if you have it as a 32-bit int. And then not a, you're basically just flipping all 32 of those bits. Um, by the way, this is also equal to negative x minus 1. So this is one of the things that uses negative and positive numbers here and deals with what's called 2's complement. So for example here, if you do uh, squiggle 5, that will give negative 6. Um, as a thing, just something you need to keep in mind. It's not always, not usually that relevant, but something to keep in mind. Yeah, and then the last operator we're going to talk about. It's not really an operator. Um, it's like more of a function, um, but pop count, um, which is built-in pop count in C plus plus. Other languages have similar functions, um, and this just returns the number of bits that are set in A. So, like if you look at nineteen, there's three ones. Um, so that has pop count three. All right, so before I move on, any questions on any of these operators? Cool, okay. Well, sorry, I don't really understand the, the pop count. Could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Uh, so basically, um, you're counting how many ones there are in the binary representation, right? So 19 has three ones in the binary representation. Um, so that would just return three. And if we had like, I don't know, like one, one would only have one bit set. So that would have pop count one. So it's going to return how many, uh, how many ones in the binary representation, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything else? 
right, uh, Keith, you want to take this next section? Okay, yeah. Uh, so now we're going to talk about how to actually use these bit operations to do a variety of useful tasks. Um, okay, so first off, um, we want to let's say you want to check whether or not the ith bit is set in some number, right? Um, so the way to do that is that we first construct a number that is only set on that ith bit. So you would do that by shifting one L, one to the left by i. If we left shift one by i, um, then we construct a number. We take one and we just shift it all the way over, adding zeros, and that gives us um, a number that is just just one at the ith position and zero everywhere else. Then if we end that with our original number, that should uh, and we check whether or not that is zero. That should give us um, whether or not that ith bit is set. So for an example. Uh, we look at i equals tw two and a equals twenty, right? We have, um, and so when we left shift i by two, we get this number, right? Zero zero one zero zero. So that is only set at position index two. Um, and by the way, i here is, is zero index, by the way. So, uh, so yeah, it's only set at the zero one two. It's only set at the, the tooth position, second position. And then when we end that, we see that uh, every all the zeros to the left and the right, they completely cancel out the rest of a. So anything at the, the positions where I to the uh, uh, one to the i is zero. Um, it cancels it out with because and needs to have both be one. So zero will cancel that out. But because it's one, if the top bit is one, it'll bring back one to the bottom. And if the top bit is zero, it'll bring zero to the bottom. And so that way, if the entire thing is zero, then we know that the bit wasn't set. If it's if it's not zero, then we know that the bit was set. Does everyone see what's happening? Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, um, so building on that same theme, we can now, instead of just getting the ith bit, right, we can try, we can talk about setting the ith bit, right? So so if you want to set it from to true, if you want to add the ith bit to a number, we can use or here. So we make that same number before, which is one at the ith position and zero everywhere else. And now if we do or, right, one or anything is one. So when we or it, at that position, we'll just have a one there, no matter what. And then the zeros on the on the left and the right will just completely not do anything. When you or when you or with zero, it does nothing, right? So so oring with the zeros to the left and right does nothing to that part of a. Only that one ith bit gets set to one. Um, similarly, we can try to unset the ith bit, which means set it to zero, no matter what it was before. Um, to do that, what we do is we take that number before, which is zeros one that one the ith bit and zeros everywhere else, and then we use a bitwise not operator to flip that, right? So remember, bitwise not just flips every single bit. So now it's ones everywhere and zero in that position, right? And now when we end that with a, the ones to the left and the right, so one and anything is just what it was originally, right? One is the identity for and, so it doesn't do anything. So the left and the right doesn't change. But at that, in the middle, at the ith position, zero and anything is always zero. So it sets that bit to zero, okay? Now, finally, we can talk about toggling or flipping the ith bit. So if it was zero, we want it to go to one. And if it was one, we want it to go to zero, right? So same thing, so now we construct this same bit Let's say same number, which is zero 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 one zero zero zero, um, and now add that ith bit zero. Remember, if we remember, zero, remember zero is the identity for zor, right? So zero zor anything is that thing itself. So a so at the left and the right, when we zor zero with that thing, it stays the same. But when you zor with one, if it was zero before, zero zor one is one, and one zor one is zero, right? Because they they're, they don't ma they, they match, so it's zero. So it's one zor one is zero. So at that position, if it was zero, it goes to one. If it was one, it goes to zero, which is what we want. It flips the bit. Is that clear? Okay. Okay, now we're gonna get into some really cool stuff. Um, and that's the idea of using um, these bits, right, the, the bit representation of a number to represent sets. So uh, in, in general, if we have a set of k items, we can talk about the subsets of that set uh, with a binary number with k bits. So uh, the way we represent it is for a given subset, we say if the ith bit is set, then we contain the ith element. So we take our original set of k elements and we label each element from zero to k minus one. Right? This element zero, element one, element two, element three, so so on and so forth. Right? Um, and then for a no and then when we have a number with k bits, we just look at the zeros and ones. And if at that position it's a one, that means in our subset we've taken that element. If it's zero, we haven't taken that element. So as an example, if we take k equals four here, right? That's not four. Oh, k, k is four. Sorry, sorry. K, k is k is a number of elements. Sorry, my bad. Yeah, so k, k equals four here. So we have four elements labeled zero, one, two, three. Um, and then w and we look at the binary representation of this number one, one, zero, one, right? Which is uh, what is that? That's 
9, right? We look at 9 here. This is the number 9. If you expand it to binary representation, uh, we see that the, the, the element at position 0, 2, and 3 are 1s, and the element at position 1 is 0. So we have elements 1, 2, and 0, 2, and 3, but not element 1. So it's like a, some, 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 it's a three element subset of our original set. And so, and so these indices refer to actual some objects that we care about, but these are just ways to index and talk about those objects uh, very compactly. Is this clear? This is kind of really important, so we're going to take a minute to make sure everyone gets this. And by the way, notice that these indices are sort of look like they're in descending order, but that's because this rightmost bit is the least significant bit, right? It has the least value. It's the ones place, and it's the twos place, and then the fours place, and then the eights place, right? So we want the least valued one to be the one that has the, the smallest index because it sort of corresponds to two to that power. Um, but 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 when you write it out, because we usually write numbers with the most significant bit to the left, which is kind of weird in English. I don't know why we do that. But when you write it out like that, it kind of looks weird. But it looks descending. But really, nothing strange is happening. Okay. So now, what can we do with these bitmaps? Why do we want to represent them as binary? These sets as binary numbers, right? So first of all, if you remember, like three slides ago, we could we we figured out how to get, flip, and set uh, bits uh, of a bitmask, right? Of, of a binary number. So we can do that to add, remove, and toggle whether or not an element's in the set. So if you want to put an element in your subset, like make a new, if you have some subset, you want to add an element to that subset, we can just do the set thing with the or. If you want to remove it, you can use the and thing with the and flip. If you want to flip whether or not it's in there, you can use this or thing. Uh, if you want to check whether an element's in a subset, you can do the, the get thing where you and it with the one to the i. Right? So this, this way we can do all our basic set operations with just a single bitwise operation, or like two bitwise operations, which is really nice. Um, further, uh, this is the really nice part, is that let's say we want to talk about all subsets of, of k, right? So if you think about um, like some k element set, and you want to think about all, the power set, right? Which is all its subsets. Um, then, we, then, then those are just all the binary numbers from 0 to 2 to the n. Right? 0 being just all zeros, right? And 2 to the n, uh, 2 to the n minus 1 being all 1s, right? Um, because, like, if you remember four, right? That was uh, fifteen. Right? It was all ones for for with four bits. Um, so if we just literally count by using nor like a normal for loop, if you go zero, one, two, three, four, all the way up to fifteen, we've enumerated all the binary numbers that represent all the subsets of our four element set. And that's really powerful. That that provides a really nice way to talk about to, and to do the, this sort of kind of difficult problem to implement otherwise of looping through all subsets of a set. And you'll see when we do problems after that, you'll see how useful that can actually be. Okay. Um, further, um, we can talk about we, uh, another nice thing you can do is construct an element, a full subset. Sort of, if we're going to talk about four elements or five elements, and this is the example I have here. Uh, let's say we want the subset that has all five elements. So we can do that by just taking one to the n, uh, two to the n minus one. And the way this side looks in, in bit representation is one shifted to the left n times and minus one. And the reason this works, of course, is that if you do like two to the n, right, which is one shift to the left shift n. It comes to look at one with all zeros afterwards, like thirty-two. It's a power of two, right? Now, when you subtract one from a power of two, those all all the bits under it become ones, and so you now you have five five ones in this case. And in general, you have n ones. Okay. Um, an, another nice thing you can do is check whether or not one subset is a subset of another subset. So, so we have this big set which all with five elements, right, or n elements, right? And we want to, we have one subset of that, and we have another subset of that. And you want to check if this subset is a subset of this subset. Um, and the way we want to do that is by, by checking if a and b equals a. Uh, the reason this works is we want to uh, make sure that uh, every element of, of a appears in b. Right? That's what it means to be a subset of b. That means for a to be a subset of b. Um, and so what, what a and b does is it restricts the, the elements to the elements that are both in a and in b. So it's like the intersection of the two sets, by the way. Right? a and b is the intersection of the two sets. Um, and and as, as a matter of curiosity, a... Uh, or B would be the union of the two sets, right? It's in either this set or this set. That's a union, right? And a, a, a is or B would be what's called a symmetric difference, but that's not, I don't know how useful that is. Um, but, but in this case, we're taking the intersection, right? We're taking the intersection of A and B, the elements that are in both of the sets. And now we're seeing, are the elements that are in both of the sets in A? 
uh, the same elements that are in A. Because if, if A was a subset of B, their intersection would just be the smaller set, right? The subset. And so this is what that utilizes. And it's very fast with just two operations, checks whether or not one is a subset of the other. Uh, any question? Again, we can go, I mean, we just wait for questions because it's, again, kind of uh, a lot, lot of information, I think. If any part is confusing yeah, and you don't have any concrete questions, I can just go over a part again if you need to. No, okay, I guess it's going on. Okay, here's some more fun stuff you can do. This, these are less important, I think, less fundamental, but they're nice, fun stuff. Um, so one thing you can do um, is if you have some subset, right, with some elements, and you want to remove the smallest element in that subset, so one thing you could use, you could loop through and find the smallest element and remove it. Or you can just do this trick, which is A and A minus 1. Okay? Um, and this will always remove the smallest element. And this is really cool. And the reason why it works, the subtracting one, the, the at, a bit, at a binary level, at a bit, bitwise level, what it does is that it flips all the bits from the right, from the least significant, right up to the last least significant set bit. So if you look at A here, right? A is this number, binary number. A minus 1, if you notice, the, 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 the second element of position 2, right, the, the, is uh, set, is the first element that's set. So subtracting 1 from it, what it would do is make the elements at 0 and 1 set, and it would make the element at 1 unset, right? And then what the AND does afterwards is that it removes all those elements that are not allowed to be there. So it removes all the elements, that the small elements that we accidentally, so we, we've unset the smallest element when you subtract 1, but we accidentally set all the elements smaller than that. But when we AND it with A again, those, it unsets those again. So now if you look at the, the A and A minus 1, it's just the same set as A, except the last the element has been removed. So that's really cool. Um, and you can, uh, and final thing that I want to mention is that if you want to count the, the leading zeros, there's a built-in operation for that called built-in CLZ. Um, if you want to use for 64 bits, it's like built-in CLZ LL. And this counts how many leading zeros there are to the left of like the the right mo the left most, the most significant one, how many leading zeros are there like to the left. Um, and by the way, another thing you can do with this is that if you do 63 minus it for longs, if it's for ints, it'll be 31 minus it, um, you'll get the powered leading bit. So you, for, if you look at the most significant bit, it's like 2 to the 8 or 2 to the not 5 or whatever it is, you'll get what that exponent is. And it's kind of, that's, that's nice. And it comes up in some code for like for tree stuff, which is kind of interesting that it comes up there, but it does. Um, yeah. Uh, by the way, there's a whole lot more like of these tricks that were, were uh, than I've talked about here, and you can find all of them on like Code Forces blogs and stuff, and then Wikipedia. But it's kind of uh, a lot already, I think. And uh, but if if you guys, any of you guys are interested, uh, to definitely search them up, and they're really cool to learn. Uh, any questions on this stuff, or just go on again, whatever. I don't know. People have questions, you can just interrupt. Yeah. Anyone have questions before we get into problems? Okay. So the first problem is potato sacks, um, which was actually on the ICPC a couple of years ago. Um, so you're given a sack with capacity C and uh, 10 potatoes with uh, weights given by some array. Um, so can you choose some potatoes from this list such that their total weight is exactly C? And you can't like cut the potatoes or break them or anything like that. Uh, you just have to take them like the way they are. But you can take any group you want out of those 10, basically. So any ideas for how to solve this? So one thing that makes this problem much easier is the fact that you only have uh, 10 potatoes, right? So you can have like a very high complexity in terms of like N, like your number of potatoes. Um, yeah.
Yeah, exactly. Um, so what you do is um, you can basically iterate over all two to the 10 possible bit masks and then see if they work, right? Because you want to um, pick some subset of the potatoes. Um, so by looping over all the bit masks, you get all the subsets. And for each of them, uh, you can basically just do a linear check to see if it works. So the way uh, you can do that is um, basically, yeah, so you loop over all masks from zero up to two to the minus one. Um, and then you iterate the free and if it's a uh, jth bit, that means you want to take this particular and again, we check if it's set by checking if back and one should be j and zero. Um, and so in case add total weight. And if at any point we get a weight exactly equal to C, uh, then we can set our answer string to yes. And then at the end, we just print that out. All right, uh, makes sense. So this we can basically just brute force it by looping through all possible bit masks for this one. Okay. This this code, this first for loop, is something that comes up very often. So you probably, probably guys want to like memorize that or understand that really well. Yeah, a lot of bit mask problems will have you loop through from zero up to uh, whatever your max mask is. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So the next problem um, is XOR problem. So um, basically, Tommy has n children. Um, the first one is A. The second one is B for like some numbers A and B that you're given. And then um, for every I greater than two uh, up to n, the ith child has value of the XOR of the previous two, right? So your first child is A, your second child is B, um, your third child would be A XOR B. Then your fourth child would be B XOR A XOR B. And then you sort of you iterate kind of through- like Fibonacci, that. Except, for, except instead of addition, it's like XOR. Yes, exactly, exactly. It's Fibonacci with XOR. Um, so you want to find um, the value of the nth child. And note that n here is like 10 to the 18. Um, so we need basically like a constant time solution. So anyone have questions about like the problem statement? Like you said, it is basically Fibonacci with XOR. So this is a problem where um, the properties of XOR we talked about are very important. Did you guys uh, see any patterns? It's probably helpful uh, to like write out the first few elements of the sequence and see if you can see anything.
So, um, think about like, so, so the third child is A, X, or B. And then the fourth one is um, B, X, or A, X, or B. Oh. So is there a way we can simplify that? Well, well J Jason, that's not right, because the third child, right, straight up, is just A, X, or B, which is often neither A nor B, right? But you're very close. Yeah, you're, you're definitely on the right path, but it's not exactly correct. But yeah, you're like 95% of the way there. So in terms of A uh, and B, what would the fourth one be? Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then if you go to the fifth one, um, you can go through basically a similar process and find that that one is B. Um, and now, uh, so yeah, so the first one's A, the second one's B. Then we go to A, X, or B. And then in the next two steps, uh, which you can see if you sort of do out these calculations, we get back to A and B. And because it only depends on the previous two children, um, then the pattern is going to repeat from here. Uh, so basically, um, you have this cycle of three things repeating over and over again, like A, B, A, X, or B, A, B, A, X, or B. So all that we need is um, N mod 3. Um, and then knowing that, we can know exactly what it is. Um, so the code for this would be basically just this. So you have your three options. Uh, you can put them in a vector um, and then just take the value at index n minus 1 mod 3. Because right, this way, if n is 1, then this goes to position 0, so a. If n is 2, you go to position 1, so b. If it's 3, you go to position 2. And then so on, you just keep repeating for whatever value of n it is. So this gives you a constant time solution to the problem. Any questions on this? Okay. All right, so now we have another XOR problem. Uh, so given A and B, uh, we want the smallest possible value of A XOR X plus B XOR X uh, for any X. So um, for example, A is 12, B is six, then it turns out the minimum value here is 10. So this is one where it's probably helpful to think about um, all the possible cases for like the ith bit of A and the ith bit of B and sort of see what you can do there. It's also useful to understand what plus does at a bitwise level because we haven't really covered that, I don't think, uh, except for a couple times. Um, no, I, that doesn't work.
Yeah, you, you can't uh, pull out the XOR. But um, one, you know, like I said, one useful thing to consider is um, sort of think about it bit by bit and like the contribution of each bit to your sum in total. Um, so you'll have like a few cases there based on like what the ith bit of A, ith bit of B looks like. Let's see if uh, you can sort of do anything along those lines. There's four cases, like I recommend just doing them out like one by one. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So basically what you want to do is um, you look at all the bits that are uh, set in both A and B. Um, and you if you set that bit in X, you can kind of turn it off in both of them. And if you don't set any of the other bits, um, then you can actually get an optimal solution there. Because if you have a bit that's not set in either A or B, then you definitely don't want to set that one. Because if you do set it, then you're um, sort of adding two times that bit to your sum. But if you don't set it, you're adding nothing. Um, and for any um, bit that is like, for example, set in A and not set in B, it doesn't matter if we set that bit in X. Because no matter what we do, we're going to be adding it once. So the idea is if the bits are the same, um, we want to, and if the bits are the same in A and B, we want to match them in X. And if they're different in A and B, we can sort of let X be whatever we want there. And um, here's sort of another solution that sort of gets to the same point, um, where notice that X plus Y is um, X, X or Y plus two times X and Y. And the, way, the reason this works is because you sort of add up all of the bits that only appear once um, in each number. And then every time you have two bits in the same position, like set in A and B, oh, uh, or X and Y in this case. There's a better way of like, explaining that. Uh, and what you think about, if you think about the way to sort of how you add two numbers, like grade school wise, it's going to be a carry, right? Yeah, it's the carry. So what Zor does is that it's normal, like the straight down addition. 
and then the x and y is the carry bit, and you multiply by two. Because like, you multiply by ten, like a normal addition base ten, you multiply by two here, so it's the same thing. Yeah. So if we use this identity, which is um, sort of a nice thing to have, we can get that AXRX plus BXRX equals this. And now um, if we let X equal A um, and we plug that in here, we get just AX or B. And notice that this is guaranteed to be minimal because this quantity here, um, it has to be at least AX or B, right? Because this has to be non-negative. Um, so yeah, x equals a gives us the answer. Um, but we can also pick other values of x that give the same value there. Um, so like what Jason was talking about, uh, a and b, um, where you want to kind of unset all the bits that are shared and everything else we can zero out because that doesn't matter. And sort of for the same reason, we can do a or b um, because again, the ones where it's set in a and not set in b or vice versa, um, those don't matter because we're guaranteed to add them exactly once. Right, because like let's say the ith bit of a is set and the ith bit of G b is not set, um, and let's say we have uh, ith bit of x is one, then one of those will turn into a one, one will turn into a zero. So when we add them up, we get a one. Basically, the idea is there's no way to like cancel them both simultaneously. No matter what you do, one will cancel and one won't. So that, that's why we have all these solutions for x but all of them will give A, X, or B as the answer. All right, uh, questions on this? There's a lot of like complicated bitwise operations going on here. Okay. Okay, if you wanna take this one? Oh yeah, sure, okay. Um, so here we have an array of integers, a, um, and the size of the array n is less than or equal to 25. Um, and we, we want to ask, what is the largest subset of this array such that each pair of elements in the subset is co-prime? Um, and by the way, just co-prime, when define that, is just um, when the GCD is uh, not 1. Right? The GCD between elements is not 1. Um, and if, in, so you don't have to worry about this part. Uh, C++ has a built-in GCD function, which we can call and check whether things are co-prime. So as an example here, um, for this array, the answer will be 2. For example, we can take 2 and 15 because those are co-prime. But if you want to any, add any other element, then we would have um, the GCD of them would be, let's say you would add an element that has a 2 in it. So then 2 and anything would have um, the GCD be 2. Or if you want to add any of the other elements, um, like 5, that would have a GCD of uh, 5 with 15. So those don't work. So you can only have one element that's divisible by 2 and one element that's divisible by 5. Any more, you would have um, two elements that are not co-prime. So like I keep said, the GCD function is built in. So you can uh, compute if any like pair of elements is co-prime in constant time. It's not constant. But check GCD is one. It's not constant, but it's like fast. Very fast, yeah. It's like log or whatever. By the way, we can uh, we kind of sort of cover this a f like a few presentations ago, but in the beginning of the of these series, we can do, oh, um, if a and b and b and c are co-prime, no, it, it it doesn't, right? Um, it's not. That's why we talk about pairwise co-prime. We say I I specifically mentioned each pair is co-prime, um, 
Because, for example, we can have uh, in, in, in uh, the example we have here, right? We can have uh, we have uh, we can have two fifteen and uh, what's that element? So, sort of a simpler example would uh, be eight. Two, uh, let's and say eight. you have like two three two. That, yeah. Right. So, like uh, two and three are co-prime because uh, their GCD is one, and three and two are co-prime because their GCD is one, but two and two are not co-prime because their GCD is greater than one. Um, but again, you don't really have to worry about um, too much about like computing which numbers are co-prime um, because we can do that in essentially n squared by just doing like n squared GCD checks, right? Um, and n is 25 here, so n squared is completely fine. But, um, or, or like n squared times whatever constant or whatever factor we want is usually okay. Um, so one thing maybe I should mention uh, is, is that we're allowed to do like 10 to the 8th or 10 to the 9th operations in a second. Um, and that touches the rule of competitive programming. And so that, that's what the proxy allowed. allowed. Um, and by the way, bitwise operations are very fast operations. You can do quite a, quite a lot of them in, in one second, like closer to 10 to the 9th uh, rather than 10 to the 8th. So. Yeah, because it's faster than even like doing like a normal addition or multiplication. Because uh, you're just operating on like the bits, which is like how it's storing it anyway. So it's, it's fast. So uh, assuming you have. Um, I don't know, like some way to check, like given any pair of numbers are the co-prime, which is like the GCD check, right? Uh, how would you solve it then? So like you don't even have to think about co-prime, just think about it as like a black box sort of. Like it, it could be any function of those two, but we're just having it be co-prime here. And the idea is going to be kind of similar to what we had in potato sacks before. Yeah, so like you you want to like brute force this, like because this n is like really small in this case. Um, yeah, so that's sort of step one here, is um, we can do like an n squared two to the n solution, right? right? Where um, you iterate over all of the submasks, um, and for every subset, we just check it by doing like n squared checks um, between each of the pairs in your subset. The problem is this is going to be slightly above um, what we can do in a second. So, um, yeah, so, so if you notice, two, 2 to the n is fine. It's still only three, like 30 million. But if you have the n squared in front, that makes it, too, that makes it kind of bad. Because um, then we have uh, 2 billion, or 20 billion, sorry, which is a lot more than we can do in a second. Um, and, and by the way, empirically, when we measure this, it doesn't actually turn out to be 20 billion because a lot of these loops sort of fail early. So it actually kind of becomes kind of close to fitting. But depending on how fast your language is or if you're doing the GCDs in the loop or whatever, um, this is definitely liable to go over. Um, and yeah, and, and like, like 20 billion is like a big number. It's not actually going to be 20 billion, as I, as I mentioned, it's going to fail early, but it's still going to be quite a big number. And it's going to go over in a second. So. This doesn't. This almost works, but not 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 quite. So, Akif, you want to just explain the optimization that makes it work? Uh, yeah, sure. So I guess I'll go on the next slide. Right. Um, so it turns out we can actually lower the time complexity down to n times two to the n by using some more bit magic and, and tricks. Okay. So for each element, right, we know what elements it can't sort of deal with. Right. When I say deal with, I mean what elements it can't be in, in the set together with, the elements that it has a common divisor with. Um, so we can pre-compute these, right? We can pre-compute which elements can go with each elements. Um, further, uh, these uh, this idea of, of being a, a subset, right, of the, the, which, which subset of elements can it be with is a bit mask, like we've been talking about this whole time, right? It's itself a bit mask. Right? So for example, if you look at element number two, for example, I don't know, and it can go, it can only handle, uh, it cannot handle elements three, five or seven because it has a common divisor with those. So that itself is um, a bit mass. It's a subset of our entire su set, 
right? So we can pre-compute all these for, for each of the elements. We have a bit mass, which represents what all the stuff it can't handle. Um, now we can loop over all the subsets like we did before, all two to the n subsets. And now when we do now instead of doing an n squared check, we can just do a single loop. And so for every element that exists in the array, in our in our current subset that we're looping over, we can just use an and to check there's no uh, sort of intersection or commonality between the elements that I can't deal with in our current subset. So there's and the current subset that I'm dealing with, and the subset for, for that element that, that, I'm, that I'm currently at, the, the bad subset, the subset that is that we can't handle, we and, I and that, and if that's not zero, then there's some element or current subset that the current element can't deal with. So then we fail, and, and that subset doesn't work. So now this is just a single on loop, it's a linear scan, uh, because these and operations are constant time, and so it's n times 2 to the n, which is only uh, 800 million, which is definitely fast enough with the white operations. And I think going in the code will, will actually help a lot explaining this actually. So before before you guys have any questions, let me show you the code. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and this is what the uh, code for that one. We basically the masks of ones you can't go with, um, and. We're basically checking set uh, if uh, your current mask um, intersects with the elements you can't be with, then we go to fail. So we sort of skip down to here, and we don't uh, add this into the mask. So, so if, if you notice, this is like a really nice demonstration of all the sort of use a bunch of the useful tricks we've learned throughout the presentation. Uh, so it, in line like three, you can see uh, as Oring to add an element to a set, so we're adding j to to index j to the bad set of i, right? And then here in this in this line in the for loop, this nested for loop if statement, we're checking a couple things. First, we're checking whether or not element i is in the set, right? With our with our with our trick. Then we're checking whether or not they have an em non-empty intersection. If math and bad, I have a non-empty intersection using that trick. Um, finally, then if this whole thing succeeds and doesn't fail, then we're using pop count to check how many elements are in the set. Right, because the number of ones are the number of elements in the set. And so that lets us figure out the biggest set in, in that set. So this is kind of a nice problem. And then obviously we're also looping through all the sets using this zero through one to the end thing, which is nice. So it's a whole bunch of tricks in this problem, which is cool. Yeah. Okay, so we have a couple more problems. Um, this one is really nice. Uh, so this is an interactive problem, which means that you sort of ask queries to the judge and it will reply back with an answer to you. Um, and so the way this works is there's a hidden tree with um, at most 100 vertices. Um, and up to nine times, you can send um, the judge two sets of vertices S and T. So S and T can be any two sets of vertices as long as they don't intersect. Uh, so two disjoint sets. And the judge replies with the longest path between a vertex in S and a vertex in T. And your goal is to find the length of the longest path in the tree. So there is a graph theory solution to this. Um, but there's also a solution that basically doesn't use any graph theory and is basically like entirely uh, bit stuff. Um, and I, I think that one's probably easier to come up with. Um, but if you guys have either one of the solutions or any ideas in general, feel free to speak up. So for like the bit solution, the fact that it's a graph doesn't even really matter. You're just trying to maximize, like you have some function f a b, and you want to maximize that um, using as few queries as possible, basically.
so think about if like the longest path is between u and v like how can we sort of guarantee that we always catch that for any u and v So I guess um, just because of time, we can go over this one now. Uh, it is kind of a tricky thing to come up with, but it's a very nice solution once you see it. Um, so basically the idea behind this solution is um, like I was talking about, we want to make sure that every pair uh, UV um, has U in S and V in T or vice versa at least once, right? So for every pair, we want to make sure they're in different sets for one of our queries. And the way we can do this is notice that if u does not equal v, um, then they must differ in at least one bit. And note that in our best solution, we always have to have u not equals v because the distance from u to itself is zero, which is never going to be maximal. Um, yeah, so n is less than 100. So each vertex um, is at most seven bits, right? If you write it out in binary, um, because they're all less than two to the seven. So you take at most seven bits to write them out. So now what we can do is um, on the jth query, we let S be the set of indices with the jth bit on and T be the set of indices with the jth bit off. Um, so for example, for the first query, S is the set of odd numbers, T is the set of even numbers. Then for the second query, um, S is the set of numbers that if you take the mod four, it's like two or three. And T is the set of numbers that are mod four, like zero or one. And we sort of keep splitting it like that by looking at um, is the jth bit set and sort of splitting them into two sets. Um, and because we check this for all seven bits, we're guaranteed to check every UV pair at least once, right? So if we just take the max over these seven queries, um, the max of those is going to be our best answer because we know that whatever best answer uv we have um, in one of the queries, u was in one set, v was in the other. So that's kind of the nice non-graph theory way to do it. There's a way with like binary search um, and like longest path in the tree we talked about a couple weeks ago in the graph theory lecture. But I think this is a little bit easier to understand. Questions on this? Okay, and then our last problem is make good, uh, which is you're given an array of n integers and you want to append at most two elements to it such that um, the sum of the resulting array equals two times the XOR of all the elements in the resulting array. And note that because it's associative, we don't need to specify parentheses because the parentheses can be arbitrary. So for example, if a is one, two, three, you can sort of extend that to one, two, three, six, because the sum, which is 12, equals two times the XOR, which is six. So if you guys were here, this was, um, I don't know, like five or six weeks ago when we did um, the lecture on code forces A and B problems. This is not an A or B problem, but it sort of uses the same like kind of method of thinking um, where like it relies on like a very simple trick kind of. Um, so I'll give you guys a minute to think about that. So don't, don't like overthink it, I guess is the point. 
and this is another one where um, properties of XOR become important. you're like very close. Um, so the sum, well, the sum is kind of one of them. Um, so notice that adding the zero doesn't actually do anything uh, because it's not gonna impact the XOR or the sum. Um, but yeah, you're very close. Because I don't think the XOR would be half the sum in this case necessarily i i mean the, the classic example is if you just have a single element right like element five then five plus five is ten but five or five is zero so you screwed up yeah so in this case um it works because um you get the xor is like exactly this element um so actually yeah this is uh, kind of a nice way to think about it um how can we get to a case where, like, if we add the sum to the end, the XOR is just the sum. Because here we're already in that case, so we don't need to sort of add that second element. Um, but how can we get to a case where, like, if you append the sum to the end, the XOR would just be the sum? Why does it work in this case, for example? Is the... Right. And this again goes back to the properties of XOR we were talking about. So what if we look at the XOR um, of this array by itself? So if we take XOR, like one XOR, two XOR, three, um, it turns out we get zero. Um, so yeah, we, we don't need to use the X plus Y trick for this one. But yeah, so if we look at the XOR of this array, one XOR, two XOR, three, uh, it turns out that this is zero. And it sort of makes sense that if you append the sum, to an array that has XOR zero, um, then it works, right? Because let's say your, um, your XOR is initially zero and you append your sum to the end. Now your XOR is zero XOR of the sum, which is the sum, and your sum is two times the sum. So then you have this condition satisfied. So now the question is, can we make the XOR zero by appending one element? How would we do that? So does what I was saying um, about that make sense? Like if your array XOR is zero and then you add the sum to the end of it, um, then your new array XOR would be zero XOR the sum. So that's just the sum. And then your sum is two times the sum. So you have your equality satisfied. Um, it looks like it's on the right track. Uh, so what you can all ninety nine percent of the way, just one thing is wrong. Like... Yeah, I think it might even have been a typo potentially. Um, but yeah, we can just go into it. So basically, what you can do is um, 
basically what you can do is take the XOR of your initial array, right? So uh, X equals XOR of everything here. So what happens if we append X to the end of the array? Then our XOR is going to become um, all of this XOR X, which just turns into X XOR X, which is zero. So now we have an array that has um, total XOR zero, which like we were talking about before, means we can now just append the sum of this array uh, to the array, and then that satisfies the uh, problem statement, right? So after we append the XOR, XOR becomes zero, sum becomes whatever this quantity is. And we have that equal S. So now if we append S to the end of the array, um, we get an XOR of all of this, which turns into X XOR X, right? Because these all uh, XOR to X, and then XOR S. So these Xs cancel, we get S. And then the sum of the array, notice that this quantity here is S, um, so we get 2s. And then this array satisfies the property we want, where the sum is 2 times the XOR. Yeah, exactly. OK, uh, any questions on this? All right, cool. Um, so thank you guys for coming. Uh, as always, the slides are up, and we'll have the recording up soon. Um, and on Wednesday, we're going to do a contest based on this kind of like bitwise uh, problems. So that should be a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, Jason, it's uh, a lot of the problems like code forces and, and elsewhere. They'll purposely put red herrings um, in the examples to throw you off the yeah. track. It's, it's really annoying. So you often you often like learn to not pay attention to the examples, except as a test. Yeah, yeah just look at an example. I, I use the example to understand the problem. And about, yeah, like, I mean, in this case. The example was good, right? Because like you sort of got the idea of like appending the sum to the end, which was like a useful idea. But there was like the the one step they were hiding from you, which is the XOR. But yeah, uh, hope to see you guys Wednesday.